thank you everybody for sticking around uh, end of the day and I'm sure your brains are getting a little slow I know mine is but uh, we're going to talk about debugging node.js applications my name is Sequoia McDowell as mentioned you can find me in the following places online if you're interested uh, so welcome to debugging Node.js. I've been writing Node for a long time, since about version 0.3, back when every time they did a point release, it would break all your applications. And back then, it was very much Wild West. And because it's JavaScript and there's no strict types, it's still kind of Wild West today. But the tooling environment has advanced a lot. And there's lots of great tools out there for, uh, for making your Node.js applications more robust in terms of logging and in terms of uh, debugging and making it easier to uh, locate issues and locate performance issues and debug them. So people who have worked in Java are very familiar, of course, with interactive debuggers, et cetera. They use Eclipse all the time. But one of the things that caused me to make this talk and write about this, blog about it, is because I was talking to a friend who's a much more skilled developer than I am. And I was showing her how to set up the debugger in Node, and she said, what's this, what's, what's that red thing over there? What's, it was a, a setting of a breakpoint. And I said, wait a second, you've never, you've never used an interactive debugger? You've never seen an interactive debugger? And I realized there's a whole swath of the JavaScript community in particular who's never even used these things and doesn't know how they work. And so today I'll be going through and introducing how to use the interactive debugger along with other things in Node.js. So if you know how to do that, it'll be a little bit of review, but you'll also see the Node way. So, we're going to talk about some general debugging tips. These are basics, it's review, but it's fundamental because if you don't do these things, then the more advanced strategies won't work. We're going to talk about logging, when you do it, how to do it, etc., cetera, uh, different strategies. Step through debugging, uh, also called interactive debugging, and some advanced debugging like CPU, uh, taking CPU snapshots, uh, memory, heap dumps and comparing them and doing some analysis there to try to look for performance issues. So without further ado, let's jump in to some debugging tips. There's three of them I have here. They're very fundamental, basic. One is throw error objects. Two is name functions. And three is use assert. So throw error objects. In JavaScript, as you know if you've ever written JavaScript, JavaScript is extremely loosey-goosey. And it doesn't really care what type anything is. So while when you throw something, it qualifies as an exception, which is defined as any value that's thrown as a result of an invalid operation or the target of a throw statement, you don't necessarily have to throw an error. You can throw a number, a string, an object. You can throw a regular expression. JavaScript doesn't care. So there are some problems with doing this, however. If you throw like this, try throw something went wrong, catch E, and then you try to log E.stack, the stack is undefined. It didn't, take a, it didn't capture a stack trace. It is the process of constructing an error object that takes the stack trace and uh, attaches it to that object so you can use it downstream. So the solution is try throw new error. Something went wrong. It's just the same. It has a message, and we have a nice stack trace attached to it. And these are important later on. Second tip, name functions. Here in our uh, bad section, we can see we're uh, calling some asynchronous functions that take callbacks. We have database connect, connection, find all, file system read. This is like a database lookup. And we say uh, connect to the database. And when the connection is ready, then use a connection with this function, uh, find all, and then uh, use the results with this function, and here's our other callback function. So when we run into a problem and we want to look at a stack trace, it looks something like this. And this is terrible because we have get user and what call get user anonymous function, anonymous function, anonymous function. So while you can do this anonymous function expressions in JavaScript, it's basically never recommended. Always name your functions. Here is the same code. All we did was name the functions name the function expressions, and now our stack trace is, these aren't the same function names, but our stack trace is, we can say, okay, get user through an error, and uh, that was called by get item, which was called by build db query, which was called by create database. And this makes it a lot easier to scan our stack trace and see what is going on. Let's see. 
15, 16, 15, okay. Second tip, use a cert, or third tip, use a cert. So here, I have a configuration object, it's for a web server or something, and we have a few properties on there that are absolutely required, or we wanna exit the application, or at least throw an error and handle it somewhere else. So we wanna check that host is present on the configuration object, and we wanna check that port is present and that the type of port is a number. So we can say, if config host, or if not config host, et cetera, et cetera. In Java, it's very common, who writes Java here? And of you who write Java, who uses assert frequently? Some people, okay. In the code I saw, people use assert a lot. I thought it was kind of great. Node.js also has an assert API built right in. So in addition to things like just assert, which it check, checks that this is truthy. Uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with, with what truthy means in JavaScript. In JavaScript, things can be truthy or falsy. So something like a string is truthy, but if the string is empty, then it's like a false. So uh, in any event, it checks, it, it checks for truthiness here. But you can also do more strict assertions like uh, assert.equal, assert deep equals for an object, et cetera. And basically, this is just a shorthand. It takes a value, uh, throws an error if something's wrong, and you can optionally give it a message that will be attached to that error. And using assert makes your code more concise. It makes it more readable. You can see uh, immediately what's going on. You know, it's clear that I want to assert that it's, it's clear what the intention of this statement is more so than this. I kind of have to read through the whole thing to figure out what's going on. So use assert. It's like Java and it makes an error with a step trace an optional message. Console logging. Moving on to logging. So you're writing your application and you are having a problem somewhere and so you add some console log statements. Here we have an application, maybe it's got a, a, a web server in Express, it's got a router, we wanna log when somebody hits our, our posts, our users' routes. We have a database API and it emits a query event every time you query the database and we just wanna say every time a query comes through, go ahead and log that. And we also have some, some sort of custom logging stuff we want to do for our users module. We want to say when, when we call our users look up, before we look up, say which user we're looking up, and then after uh, output that user, because you know, something's going wrong with the user look up. So you add these console log statements in so you can figure out what problem you're having, and then you fix the problem, and you're all done, and so you, what do you do? You delete all your console log statements, and then you check the code in. And then a week later, a bug comes up, and you uh, go back and you're like, oh geez, I need to log, I need to debug the user module again. I wish I still had those, you know, logger statements in. So you go, you add them back, and this time you check your code in and you just comment them out. And so then you have commented out uh, console log statements all over the place. And this obviously creates a problem because it's easy to forget to comment something out. You check your code in, the code review, it gets rejected, it's embarrassing, it's terrible. And I know what you're thinking, there's got to be a better way, and there is. What we wanna do essentially is keep our console log statements, but be able to optionally turn them on when we want and turn them off when we don't want. And there is a module for this, and it is called debug. Debug is one of my favorite NPM modules just in the sense that it's very small, it's very simple, it does one particular thing. I usually add it uh, when I'm starting a new project right near the beginning. And all it does is it allows you to use an environment variable to turn debug logging on or off uh, based on the environment. So we're gonna install and save debug in our project, and then in order to uh, start logging with debug, we require debug and we create a logger, and in order to create a logger, we have to give it a label. Uh, we're gonna call it my app. That's our my app logger. Log test and then set timeout in 500 milliseconds. Uh, uh, do another log message here. Now, who's familiar with the printf from C or Java? So this allows you to put things, you know, percent %d for, for a double or percent %s for a string. And you'll note here that with debug, there's uh, some extensions on that. In particular, percent %j, which is nice uh, for logging JavaScript objects. If you say console log a JavaScript object or pass it to debug like this, what you'll get is object, 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 because it says, you know, the two string method returns the string, open bracket object, object. This will say, no, treat it as a JavaScript object. I want to see all the keys and values. So we start our script and the output is, um, is nothing. It's nothing right now because 
By default, debug does not turn these loggers on. So if you're in a production environment or whatever, these are just no-op functions. What we need to do is pass an environment variable. And of course, this is one way of setting environment variables by putting them in front of the command. But the whole point of environment variables is that you, they are dependent on your environment, and you can set them all kinds of different ways. If you have a Docker container, I think you can put them in the Docker config. If you have on AWS, there's probably some way to do it. And so that means that you know, on, uh, on production, you can, you can have these turned off, and somewhere else you can turn them on. Here, I'm turning it on just for this process. Now, we get this debug output where it says, uh, my app, it has the label, has a color, has the messages, and then they have the timings over here. And this is just the time since the last debug, uh, since the last call to the logger. And so those timings, these aren't really, these, these aren't super precise and they're not, uh, they're not especially customized, but they're just there and they're kind of useful just as an extra thing to add in. So now let's use our logger on the code that we just set up. So we're going to replace the console log statement with log and set the debug environment variable to my app. And this tells the debug module that we want to turn on the debugger labeled my app. And when we run our script, it's the same as before, except for you know we have the labels and we have the timings. So this is useful. It's kind of useful for the query. You can see you know plus 108 found user. You can see that it took about 108 milliseconds to run that query. But this isn't that useful because it's kind of like turning on the whole application verbose mode. And we can do better with them. We can do better with this because if you have a bug in the users module, you don't want to turn debugging for your whole application on. You want to just turn the debugger on for that portion. Now, what we need to do first here is instead of having one debugger, we're going to create several different debug loggers. And they are going to have labels that are different, but the labels share a common property, which is a namespace. And in the debug module, essentially, the namespace separator is a colon. And then all of these ones, my app colon, are in the same namespace. And we can turn them all on together, off together, et cetera. We have one for database, one for routes, and one for users. And we'll use the different logs in the different places. So in the users module, we'll use the users log. And the routes module, we'll use routes log. And ditto with the DB module. And one of the things I like to do is actually put all of these loggers in one big file called debuggers, and then just export them. And then if I want to use them in different places, you're using the exact same one. So that's a fun thing to do. So now we're going to turn on my app colon star. And this says match everything in the my app namespace and turn those ones on. And when we run our script like this, we can see we have the, the different labels for different debuggers. They're nicely visually offset with colors. So it's easy to scan visually and see which one's which. And we still have our timings here, which are incidentally since, I believe, the last call of that exact debugger, not of any debugger. So what if you're only debugging the database? We can just turn on our database de debug database logger. So here, debug equals my app database, and all the other ones are turned off. Just the database one is turned on. Or maybe we're working on we're having some issue with the user routes, and we want to turn on the routes debugger and the users debugger. We can say one name one label comma the other label and turn both of those on. Alternately, maybe you have one debugger in particular that's very noisy, like the database logger is uh, logging every single query, and you want to turn everything on but just turn the database one off. You can say comma minus whichever one you don't want. So here we turned on everything. So allow all, then deny the database logger. Debug is widely used. This is a nice benefit of it. it um, here I'm going to turn on. I say debug equals star and start an express server. And we'll see that express actually also uses the debug module internally. And it has tons of different namespaces and loggers. There's express application for startup, express router, this is when you're adding routes. And then express route, this is when, uh, I don't know what this one is. But down here, we have our app. This is the one that I added. Uh, app is a common convention for the one that you're not going to export as a module, but if it's just your top level application, use the app namespace. And then we can also see down here, we have another library, SQLib, that is uh, also using debug. So I encourage you in your Node applications to just set the environment variable uh, debug 
to star and see if any of your dependencies are using the debug module. It's really great because then uh, if you're like, oh, I'm having a problem with my with with Express or with my uh, with my ORM, if you turn on debug and you can say debug equals my ORM colon star and turn on the debuggers for that dependency, that's really nice. Finally, this is a node talk, but debug also works in the browser. This is a case where I was making an editable map, and there are all kinds of different events with like click editable and drawing, drawing end, and you know drawing stop, and, and I was getting confused about the interaction, so I attached a debugger with a different namespace to every single event, and then as I went through and clicked on things, I could look at what's happening and uh, and then figure out, uh, discover how the application was working. So. Debug module is great, you should start using it. But what if you need more robust logging? Debug really only just helps you turn things on or off on the console. If you need to do something like write to React or write to Paper Trail or a third party logger or to syslog, you want something like Winston. Winston has log levels, has multiple transports, and it has formatting plugins. So for example, if you like uh, your Apache logs and you want to make your node logs look exactly the same, you can add a custom formatting function so anytime you call the logger, it will uh, format it with a timestamp or whatever you want. So we install Winston, require Winston, and then this exports one default logger. You can create more loggers if you want, but this creates one by default. And then the API is a little bit different from debug. We say winston.log, we give it a log level, and then a message. And also there are shorthands for these log levels, winston.info, winston.debug, etc. So now when we start our application, we'll see info a uh, couple of info statements, but we called the logger four times and we're only getting two debug statements output. Why is that? It's because Winston has the concept of log levels. Who's familiar with log levels from other environments? Yeah, log levels are a fairly common concept. These are the NPM log levels. You can also use the syslog log levels. Uh, these are just the default ones, but Winston works with both. Basically, for anybody who's not familiar, Log levels, uh, rather than like in debug where we create a ton of custom, essentially custom labels and custom namespaces, with log levels you say, uh, right now I'm in a production application, set the log level to zero. I only want to see something come out of the logs if there's a critical error. Or you might have a continuous integration server, or maybe your production server is having some problems, or you just want to check on stuff, so you turn it up to one, so you see warnings and errors. Maybe when you're working locally, you have it on info, and then when you're having a problem, then you turn it all the way up to debug, and then it starts uh, outputting all kinds of information. So the default level is info. You can switch it to debug. Winston doesn't do a lot of the stuff out of the box for you. It allows you to do it programmatically, which means you can pick the criteria that you want to use to set uh, the log, whether it's the, the environment variable like I have set here, or whether it's based on the URL, based on uh, the machine name, etc. So it's much more powerful and a little bit more complex. Winston transports. These are extensions that send log messages somewhere. Winston has a few of them built in. Here you can see I'm adding Winston transport file to log to some log .file, some file log, and I'm removing the console transport. With Winston, you can have multiple transports. So if you want to, exa for example, write it to React, but also write it to a local file, or send it to paper trail, but also output it to the console standard error, then you can uh, do both of those things. It has a few built-in transports, file cons console and HTTP, but there are tons of additional transports for Winston. And if you don't see the one that you use, the logging system you use here, then run npm search Winston, and you can see the dozens of other, uh, dozens of other Winston transports. So chances are, for whatever system you're using, it already has a transport for Winston set up. Let's see, 18 minutes, we're at 53. Okay, so. Absolutely, because it's pro so. The question is, can you can can you control the log level uh, at runtime? And absolutely, Winston doesn't have any utilities for that built in, but probably people have utilities. But because it's just because this is literally how you set the log level, you could create a custom API endpoint. You could have a shell script that does it. You could anything that changes uh, anything that you just hit your application somehow and tell it uh, with some input. Yeah, one of the things. Uh, uh, there's another module called heap dump that uses kill signals. 
So, you know, kill dash nine, et cetera, those actually send a, a signal to the application. And so with heap dump, you can say, like, kill dump and just point that at your application and then inside your application you can catch it. So that might be one way to uh, investigate. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and Winston has its own format. And Winston actually has a lot of other things. So it has its own format to write logs to MongoDB. And there's actually a log viewer. You can use Winston. I have it here just for logging. But you can actually use it as a log viewer as well. So it has a, a method to like write to the logs and also to query your logs or to view them visually, et cetera. Um, I kind of consider that side stuff because you, you know the point is you can go to a bunch of different places and MongoDB is an option. Or you can write your own MongoDB connector if you wanted. So. Moving on, interactive debugging. Where am I time-wise? Okay, okay. So interactive debugging. This is something, as I said, common in Java, .NET, and other worlds, but it's unfamiliar to many JavaScript developers, and I think this should change. And so I've made it my life's mission to go evangelize interactive debuggers to JavaScript developers, and hopefully I can convert some people today. So I'll explain how to do this and explain what interactive debugger does generally. So if you're familiar with it, It'll be a little bit of review, but basically what an interactive debugger does is it allows you to pause your code execution at some point and then inspect or alter the application state. You can look at objects in memory, see their values and change them. You can also see the code execution path or call stack. So if function A calls B calls C and you have a breakpoint down in C, you can say, how did I get here? And if you pause the execution in function C, you can look back up the call stack to see how you got there. And it allows you to inspect the application state at earlier points. So if you're in function C, you set a breakpoint, and you're like, how did I get here? How did, why did function A call function B? You can rewind back up, look at the application state uh, from an earlier function call, an earlier frame, as it were, and see how you got there. So debuggers are useful in writing your own code, but I also find them extremely useful for debugging other people's code and familiarizing myself uh, with code that I'm not familiar with. So I recommend getting your debugger set up right away. So there's a few ways to debug, uh, to use the interactive debugger with Node.js. One is there is a built-in terminal-based debug client. The second is a Chrome debugger, uh, which is specifically for debugging V8. So it has some more powerful V8 uh, debugging features. And then IDE debuggers, and we're gonna talk about VS Code. So let's start with the built-in debugger. We start our application, that the, the startup script is bin www, and we're gonna start it with uh, no debug bin www. And nothing has, been, no, no, nothing has been installed besides Node.js uh, in terms of debugging. This comes, this, the, no debug ships with the Node binary. And we run no debug, it starts the debug server, and then immediately attaches a client they're in the terminal and we can look at our uh, debug session in the shell. So you can see here we've stopped on line seven, it immediately breaks on the first line and uh, we can start looking around. I'm gonna hit N in order to step to the next line and then it stopped on line eight. And uh, I'll enter the help command to see what else we have available here. And you see we have R for run, C for continue, uh, S for step, step into a function call, O for step out of a function call. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and hit C to continue and then dot exit to quit this debug session because it's useful to know that this thing is here but it's, it, and you can set breakpoints. You can do basically everything you can do with a more powerful debugger but it's, this is hard to use. And so um, I don't, so just know that it's there and let's move on to the easier to use tools. Uh, if you find yourself on some server and you wanna start a debug session in Node, you could do it this way. So let's look at Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code is kind of like, it's, a, it's like an editor IDE hybrid. Uh, I think that Microsoft kind of wanted to court people in the open source community and maybe bring people into VS Code who aren't familiar with it or wouldn't be uh, typically people who'd use VS Code. So people like me who are web developers primarily and uh, open source application developers and I've never used Visual Studio in my life. And so, but I do use and really like VS Code. And it's written by Microsoft, it's written in JavaScript. It's kind of like if you're familiar with the Atom editor from GitHub, it's very similar to that. It's kind of like Microsoft's fork of Atom with a bunch of integrated JavaScript stuff. 
and it's free and open source, you know, open source free, which is to say you probably have to sign some sort of contributor licensing agreement to use it, but you don't have to pay for it. So let's set up a project so we can debug with VS Code. This first step here is just, if you want to follow along at home, this is just scaffolding an Express app. And I'm doing this just so I have a, 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 an application, a, a common baseline to start debugging. So I'm going to install a generator, which is, this is just an Express scaffolder. Run Express test app, it creates an application with a few routes and stuff like that. And then change directory into it and npm install. Now we can run npm start and our Express app is up and running. We haven't done any debugging yet, this is just getting the app running. So now from the application directory, we run code dot that pops open uh, Visual Studio Code. And we can get started with our debugging. Well, not exactly. We have to first tell Visual Studio Code how we want to debug our application. So there's a couple of ways to launch the debugger from Visual Studio. And one is to launch the application from the shell or launch it however you normally launch a node application and then attach the debugger to a running application. And the other way is to launch it from VS Code. And the second way is the way that you would generally do while developing. So if, you, or, and if you're used to uh, debugging in something like Eclipse, that's very similar. You, you know, set up, you tell, it, you tell the IDE how you want to launch your your program, and then you say, you know, debug, and it will launch a debug session. The first way is for attaching to a running node instance. And this is the way sometimes I get questions like, can I debug node in a Docker container? Can I debug node on a remote server? And the answer is yes. You just have to start node with, uh, well, let's look right now how you do that. So in order to start debugging, we have to tell VS Code how to start our application. We click over here to the debug pane, this little X over the bug, and we want to click the green button, but it's not going to let us do that because it says you have no configurations. I'm sorry if that's very small and hard to read. Over the gear, you can see a red dot, and you click on that, and it says, hey, I can generate some launch configurations for you. What kind of project is this? And we want to say, well, it's a Node.js project. And it says, OK, great. Here are a couple of launch configurations to get you started. <clears throat> so it's nice and easy to get started here. Let's take a look at these configurations. They're in test app, you know, the, the application directory dot VS code, which is where VS code puts its own configs, uh, launch.json. And this is the type of thing I definitely always want to, you know, track in my version <laughs> tracking system, check into uh, the remote Git repository so other developers can check it out and use it. Uh, this is definitely something I like to keep in Git. Now, the first one we're going to look at is uh, the one that's highlighted down here. The, uh, there's two configurations. And the first one we're going to look at, the request type is attach. So this is saying, I'm, I'm not launching an application. I just want to attach to a running application. Uh, the type is node. This just indicates to VS Code what kind of debugger it's going to be using, because it can debug C sharp and TypeScript and all kinds of other things. The name, you can change the name, and the address and the port. So obviously, if you were trying to debug a remote instance, then you would need to change those values. So we want to launch our app and attach. So we launched the debug server. Earlier when we did no debug, we were launching the debug server and immediately attaching a client in the terminal. Here, by using no dash dash debug, we are launching the debug server, but we don't have a client attached. So it's going to go ahead and just proceed and output our, you know, our uh, start our server and start listening on port 3000. So now that the, debug, the, the server is listening, we can then attach the debugging client, in this case, which is VS Code. So we select attach to port over here, hit the little green button, and now we have, uh, we have a debug session started. And you can tell because we have this little, we have the panes over here, variables, watch, call stack, breakpoints. Nope, there's nothing in them because uh, these inspect the state of the memory or the variables pane inspects the state of the memory at a certain point in code execution. So Unless you are paused somewhere, it can't tell you what's going on in memory. You can see the controls up here, basically what you'd expect from an interactive debugger. One thing to note there is on the far right, that has a little plug on it. 
the stop, uh, it's just saying I'm not actually stopping the server, all I'm doing is detaching the debugger. So we'll set a breakpoint here on line six, and when our home page is requested, we want to stop code execution. So we go to our browser, we request localhost 3000, and we hit enter, but it will not load, it will just sit there and spin and spin and spin, but VS Code will pop open and say, okay, I'm stopped, we have a break on line six. So the red dot is our breakpoint, and you can see this little uh, yellow indicator here uh, indicates that this is the current frame that we are paused on. <coughs> so execution is now paused. You can see that the variables pane is populated, as is the call stack. Let's take a look at the variables pane. So here, in our local scope, local to this uh, request handler function, I can see that uh, it, it gets passed next in uh, response and request. And you can see over here next is a function, request is an incoming message, response is a server response. And already I've learned something because I know that express has its own request and response type. But when I look here and see, oh, request is incoming message, hey, that's a, uh, I know that's, a nor that's from the node core APIs. And so, uh, so this must be, Express must just be extending the node core uh, HTTP incoming message and HTTP server response. So uh, by looking at the constructive here, we've already learned something from our debugger. So let's open the request object and look around. One of the things that's nice about this is that a lot of these objects are really big. So if you try to do something like console log or even like console.dir, which will output the whole thing as an object, it's difficult to look through these, but with the code, with the code execution paused, you can, at your leisure, uh, explore that object. If we scroll down a little bit here and open the headers, we can, we can look at all of the request headers that came in. So that's useful. And we can also see the HTTP version, the method, and uh, the original URL, etc. So this is a good way to discover what's available. Now, of course, everybody documents their project meticulously and keeps the documentation up to date. But that said, sometimes that doesn't happen. Documentation uh, goes out of date, things are not well documented, uh, sometimes it's incomplete. This is the ultimate source of truth. Either reading the source code or even better, just inspecting, inspecting the code, uh, inspecting the memory while your application is running. This is the best way, better than documentation, to discover what's available. So let's say our issue is in the rendering itself, not here. So we've paused here on line six, this response.render, but we're having an issue. Uh, we could press play and it would complete the response. We're having an issue with the rendering itself. So we're gonna click the step into uh, button to step into that function call. You can also hit F11. There are shortcut keys for all of these. <clears throat> I recommend learning them because then you can cruise through your code nice and fast. So we step into this function call. Now we are in, uh, okay, we step into our function call and now we are stopped on line 938 inside of response.js which is part of the express framework. Now we wanna see what is in our, what is in that app object and currently in the variables pane, it's undefined because we've, we've, it's been declared because all the declarations are hoisted because it's JavaScript, but it, the assignment hasn't happened yet. And we want to see what's in there. So what we're going to do is click step over or hit F10. And now we step to the next line. We're on 939 and we can see that that uh, app local variable is now populated. <laughs> so. That's well and good, we know how to step into functions, how to step over, step out. Uh, what that does is it says run code all the way to the return statement, then return and then break. And so if you, you're stepping down into some libraries and you say I've gone way too far, you can step back out and try to get into your code again. So let's look at editing variables in the variables pane. So in the course of your work, sometimes you might find yourself testing by saying, set this variable value to this, control save, and then run your script and see what happens, and then set the variable to that, and then save, and then run your script again and see what happens. Uh, this is tedious and time consuming, and nobody likes it. So instead, why not just pause the execution of your running script and edit the value of in-memory variables uh, in your running script? Then you no need to restart, no need to edit your code. So here we are stopped on line 939, and we want to edit the options that are passed to our template. Currently, the only data that's being passed to our template is the title. The title says express, and that sets our title and sets, you know, uh, sets the, the header, et cetera. 
And we want to change that, so we double click on it. We edit it to what we want. We hit, hit enter. We've now updated it in memory. And now I'm going to click continue. Or you could also hit F5. And all this time, our server has been waiting. It's just been hanging. But when we, uh, we hit F5, then it responds to the server. And now we can load with the new value here. And now our template is rendered with the new value we set in live in the memory with the debugger. Bahotacha. <laughs> so let's say we want to go back to the caller. We stepped in too far. So we're in our, you know, rewind your mind. We're, we're on line 938 here. But we decide, actually, um, I stepped in too far. I want to go back to see who called this. Now, I'm, this is where we're going to look at the call stack. And can anybody see the problem here? What is that? Um, you can. <laughs> well, look at that right now. But uh, the problem I'm looking for is that it's kind of hard to see, but anonymous function, I haven't named my my request handler. And so this is the, the dreaded anonymous function in your call stack that you're like, what the hell is this? So name your functions. So I announce over this, I click on it. And then note that the little indicator here, it's hard to see, but it's green. And this is saying, this is not the current frame. This is, we're just inspecting another frame. Now, if you look at the variables pane here, this shows variables that are local to this frame, which is this point in code execution. When you, when you go back, to an earlier frame, now the, the variables that are available in that local scope are different. And so you can see things from that frame. Now, we're just kind of peeking at that frame right now. The current frame is still this one. We're just kind of uh, viewing an earlier frame. But if we want to rewind, we can right click and then hit restart frame. And then this will pop us back to this location. So if we are in A and calls B, calls C, we set a breakpoint in C, and we say, actually, uh, I want to change something in A and, and call this whole stack again, you can go back up to, to that frame that A is, right click, restart frame, and you basically reround your code. Not all debuggers can do this. Some of them can, some of them can't. The node one can now. I don't think it didn't used to be able to, and now it can, so that's great. Very powerful, step through your application, go back, see who called what, et cetera. Um, I mean, you can go and all the way, if, if I scroll down even further, it would say like, it would say show more, and then eventually you could go down to where it's like, you know, it's, it's, it, it's always, it always starts with some internals from V8 or from nodes. So it'll be like, it'll be like event execute process next tick or whatever, and you can't really go Yes, but I think that this is, I think that this is only, um, this is when you have no dash dash debug turned on. This is when you have the debug, uh, the debug tooling set up. So obviously there is, a, there is process overhead. You wouldn't want to run this on your production server unless you really needed to debug something. So let's look at our other launch configuration. So it's annoying that when we want to we want to change our code and restart, we have to go back to the shell, hit control C, go back to VS code, click attach again. We want to launch it from VS code, make it so we can launch, relaunch, et cetera, from there. So let's look at the other launch configuration. It's called launch program. The request type is launch rather than attach. The type is still node. And the program, this is basically an entry point. This is for this launch configuration, what script should I start with? And you can do all kinds of things. VS Code has different variables like uh, current file. So if you wanted to, to set up a, a launch configuration that says whatever file I currently have open in my editor, just when I hit F5, I want you to just run that file. Uh, what we're going to do is workspace root bin www. Now, how did it figure that out? Because I haven't edited anything yet, but it already knows what our startup is. And this is not like some sort of standard. So how did it figure this out? Node or bigger pardon, VS Code is able to look at it because it knows things about Node projects. It's able to uh, look around and make some educated guesses about your project. So here, it's looked in our package.json. It looks in our scripts, and start is the npm runtime script, which is kind of like special scripts that uh, are standardized and, and, and fixed. And uh, npm start or npm run start is the standard way to say this is how you start this application. And so it looks here, it sees, ah, you, to start the application, you run node and then dot slash bin www. So it's able to find that 
parse it out, and then build it into a launch configuration for you. Because unfortunately, you can't just set launch configurations to say, npm run my script. That would be really super convenient, and I hope they add that feature in the future. But if you have a complex launch config, if you have a complex startup script in, in npm scripts, you will have to recreate it here, which is a little annoying, but that's okay. Um, so now we want to launch our application from here. We switched from attached to launch program. We stopped our other running instance, otherwise it would say the port 3000 is in use. We press the play button, and now I've set a breakpoint on line one, and we are running it from VS Code. And you can see here that the debugger is listening down here. Uh, the, the, the debug out, so the console output is now here in our, in our uh, IDE. So this is great if you like using your IDE, you want to see the console output there, you want to do your debugging from there, everything in one place, hit F5. I really like this because this means when somebody says, oh, there's a bug in this application, can you check it out? And it's something that I wrote and I have a VS Code launch configuration set up for. I just change directory, code dot F5, and like 10 seconds I have a debugger session uh, set up and running. So uh, this is a far cry from the node experience of yesteryear of console log statements everywhere. It's much better. So, more launch configurations. Let's say you have something a little more complex, like I have to set an environment variable, and I'm actually not starting from one of my scripts. I'm starting from, uh, I'm starting from uh, node modules bid node lambda, which is, a, uh, which is a tool, it's a command line tool that basically simulates the lambda, node lambda environment. In node la or sorry, in AWS Lambda. In AWS Lambda, it runs your function with a context and an event. And so all this tool does is it runs and it reads a context object and it reads an event object and we're reading them from the current working directory. And so we want to call this script, we want to, it has an argument run, and we want to set an environment variable. And it's important that we run from the current working directory because it's going to look in that directory for the event and context objects. So how you'd set that up is with the program is workspace root node modules, etc. So it doesn't even have to be one of your own scripts to start up, it could be a different tool. And arguments are run. <coughs> the current working directory, we can set the current working directory for, uh, for this. And again, you can set this to all kinds of different variables, like make the current working directory my current file or whatever. And we can set our environment variables. There's lots of other things you can set up here. If you have source maps, you can set those up. Uh, there, if you want to stop the debugger right on the first line as soon as you start it, you can, you can set that up. There's lots of stuff. I encourage you to explore it. It's very fun to set up these launch configurations. In some of my projects, I have like 10 different launch configurations, which is nice because then I can send it to another developer and they're like, how do I do this? I don't know about debugging Node. I'm just like, look, just install VS Code, clone the repo, you know, pick the drop down, hit play, you're good to go. And so uh, that, that's nice, it allows other developers to benefit from the work that you put in. So let's, with that set up, let's revisit our breakpoints and go over the different debug panes. So break on exception is checked by default. Here I'm going to add a, uh, uh, some middleware to my express application. I'm gonna use a static middleware that serves static files. And so I construct that middleware and attach it uh, to, to my router. I start the application up in the debugger and all of a sudden, uh-oh, uh, there's an error, uh, unhandled exception, root path is required. And over here, I can, if, let's say I didn't know exactly what line it was on already, I could say, okay, I have this, uh, this error message, I don't know where it came from, et cetera, maybe it's somebody else's application, maybe it's a new error that came up from wherever. So in the past, I may have had to uh, look through, I mean, even the anonymous function here, if I had an error call stack, uh, coming out in, my, uh, in, my, in, in the console, I would see an, a, an anonymous function in a file called index.js. That does not give you a lot of information to start looking. But in this case, I just click on it, see what called that, and I say, oh, okay, here we go. Um, express uh, static, I didn't give it a root path, and so I've very quickly figured out what my issue is. You can also break on all exceptions. Uh, is another option, but be prepared for a lot of noise if you do that. A lot of libraries and frameworks internally will throw and catch errors, um, and if you break on all exceptions, it just stops a lot. So you can also set conditional breakpoints. So for example, if you wanted to stop, uh, pause a request only if the, if the, uh, if the user was, if the, if the request.user 
dot role equals equals admin, then you could only pause on those requests. Or if some other condition is met, you can also pause on a hit count. I find these useful for when I'm running a script and I, there's a function I expect to be called twice and for some reason it's getting called three times. And I know why it's getting called the first time and I know why it's getting called the third time, but I can't figure out why it's getting called the second time. Then you can set a breakpoint with a hit count that stops only on the second call, etc. There's other kinds of breakpoints you can set I won't go into. There's column breakpoints in VS Code. There's a really cool feature that's kind of JavaScript specific. Sometimes you have compiled or built minified code and it's like, you know, 10,000 uh, characters on one line. With VS Code, you can actually say stop on column 5,000. That's really nice. So, watch expressions. The pane below variables here is watch expressions. If you find yourself stepping through your code in every line, you're like, okay, Look at you know, request params user or request whatever uh, user role and then you step to the next line and go check that again, step to the next line and go check it again. You can add a watch expression in here and then on each line that you're paused on, it will evaluate this expression and tell you the, uh, the current value of it. And here we have one for request query user in for process, process ID. And so this is really useful if you have state some sort of application state that's changing as you go through. You want to figure out where it's changing. And so you, you know, set a watch expression on that. You click, you know, uh, F10, step forward, step forward, step forward. And then you can see what line it stopped on. And then, uh, and then that's a good place to get started. I like using watch expressions. Finally, the debug console down here at the bottom. This not only outputs debug messages, but it also allows you to input uh, co and execute code. So sometimes you can just edit things over here in the variables uh, if it's a string or a number or something. But if you want to call something like response.setHeaders or some kind of other setter or getter function or whatever, down here in the debug console, you can uh, run code in the current execution context. Because you can't really get a request object just from the, the node console. I mean, you could, but it wouldn't have the context that you're, you want. So enough VS code. Let's look at some debugging using the Chrome debugger. So, in order to use the Chrome debugger to debug Node.js applications, you have to install a uh, <coughs> node module called Node Inspector. And how you install that is npm install dash g node inspector, node inspect my script. But, no you don't. With Node 6.3 and above, which just came out recently, or I guess a little while ago, it's built in, so you run node dash dash inspect my script, and it will start a debug server session with the Chrome debug protocol. So, and, that, and then you can just punch the URL into Chrome and you'll be attached. So before we jump in with Chrome, let's quickly review the different debug startup methods we've discussed so far. So we can say node debug my app, and that will start a debug session and attach the in terminal client. We can say node dash dash debug, and this listens for an external debugger like VS Code or another IDE. Or we can say no dash dash inspect, and this, uh, this listens specifically for the Chrome V8 debugger protocol, which is a little bit different, because this one just does breakpoints and stepping through your code. This one allows you to do all kinds of tooling with you know, uh, uh, CPU analysis, et cetera, that we'll look at now. So the Chrome debugger, we've started our app with no dash dash inspect my app. We point a Chrome browser at this URL that it gives us here. And here's our debugger. It looks very similar to the VS Code debugger. So why would we use this one instead? Advantages of our VS Code, it has specific, specific bindings for the V8, for the V8 library, uh, V8 uh, C library, etc. So uh, because Google built V8 and they also built this debugger, they work very well together. Um, you can take heap snapshots and do various types of visualizations and analysis. And you also don't need to use VS Code. So if you have a, a, a coworker and you're like, oh, check out VS Code, it's, it's great debugging Node.js. And they're like, oh, I only use Emacs and I hate IDEs. You say, okay, well, you can use the Chrome debugger. You can still have breakpoints. You have your watch expressions. You have most of the stuff you have in VS Code. And you don't have to switch your IDE. So if you know somebody who already likes the, the editor they use, they don't want to use VS Code, they can use this. I like to use VS Code. So I consider it a disadvantage that's outside the IDE. I prefer to have it 
in the IDE with my debugger right there, right where I'm working. And there's some non-node related cruft. It's, this debugger was initially built for the browser, and then they kind of had a stripped down version that just does the V8 uh, debugging and allowed you to attach it to node, but it's not really customized for node. And so there's some stuff that's a little not intuitive. Solution is use both. Essentially, uh, when you want to do V8 profiling, then you use Chrome. For other stuff, use V8, or use VS Code. So Chrome profiling. You have to connect to it. Yes. Yeah, you can connect to a remote. I mean, you have to, you have to make sure that when you're uh, in your firewalls, et cetera, that port 5858 is open or running on a different port, et cetera. But yes, you can do that. Or if it's in a Docker container, et cetera. The question is, can you connect to a remote instance with this Chrome debugger? And the answer is yes. Just make sure that the port is open. So in our profiles pane, we can record CPU profile, take a heap snapshot, or do some other stuff that we're not going to talk about. I encourage you to play around with it. With these sort of tools, it's, the debugging is as much an art as it is a science, and it just takes spending time messing around with it and seeing how it works. So we're going to start with taking a CPU profile. We're going to run some requests against a simple Node.js server, an express server with three routes, one for Fibonacci uh, that recursively calls a Fibonacci function, one that is a loop that just generates extremely large arrays of numbers with the purpose of using a lot of CPU and, uh, our, our, and our index route. The important thing here is we have handle index, handle Fibonacci, and loop handler. Uh, can you go back to the previous Where did we tell the Chrome browser like, which host and port to When we started, uh, sorry, we started uh, we started node inspect, then it gives us this URL, and we copy that, and we punch it into Chrome right here. And when we started that, that could be a remote server. Yeah. And we probably want the Chrome browser to run on a different machine. So to maybe I have this Chrome dashboard on my laptop, and this could be my Linux server. Somewhere. Yeah, so you would have to, uh, as for that sort of remote debugging, um, this says Chrome DevTools, DevTools Remote. There's a lot more here. I mean, I can try to scroll over and show what all is in here, but um, it says uh, inspect HTML uh, and then WebSocket equals localhost 9299. Uh, Basically, I think what you would do, I'm not sure. I'd have to look into that more. I believe it's possible, though. <laughs> okay, so kind of low on time here, so I'm going to keep it moving. So. We have three routes we want to uh, take a CPU profile. So we click the, the start on CPU profile, we click on our, our home route, and then we click stop on the CPU profile and go take a look at it. The first thing we're gonna look at is a flame chart. Who's familiar with flame charts? So this is a way of visualizing uh, function calls in uh, uh, graphically. So essentially what's going on here is that uh, each one of these little bars represents a function call. The width of it uh, represents the time on the CPU. So here you can see it's about 98 milliseconds, and over here is 106 milliseconds, so it's about eight milliseconds have elapsed. And by looking down here, you can see how much time the function took for itself. So you know, time that it doesn't call something else is time that function took, and then how much time it, it took, you know, the functions that it called took. And this is a normal type of flame graph you expect to see. It's called that because it looks kind of like a flame. Um, if we mouse over handle index, that's our index route, and we can see it took six milliseconds. So uh, this is normal. This is good. You want to familiarize yourself with, with, in order to do performance analysis, you need to first familiarize yourself with the normal running state of your application in order to be able to identify anomalies. So we've done that, and let's take a look at a different function. Well, wow, this one's really wide, and that indicates a lot more time spent on the CPU. Uh, in fact, you can see it says 9,600 milliseconds over here, and so it's spent almost a full second on this handler. And actually, there's a little anomaly here, which is because of the V8 garbage collection. This is actually showing many calls to the loop handler, because it calls loop handler, and then it has the garbage collect and calls it again, garbage collect. This is actually all one call. 
Uh, why that is, I'm not totally sure. But in any event, you can see a really long bar. And this bottom here, where it's not calling anything else, that is time spent on the CPU. So if you see an extremely long bar that's not calling anything else, that means that particular function is using CPU. So we mouse over one of these sections and it says 61 milliseconds. Uh, then we want to say, okay, what the heck is this thing? Um, what's taking so much time? You can click on it. And then you jump to that line of code and find out what exactly is uh, where in your code this is happening. So this is a great way to uh, look through if you think that something is, if, if the CPU usage is going high, you can uh, run your server in debug mode, start CPU profiling, do some interactions, hit some routes, click on some stuff, whatever you think is causing the problem, and then see what's using CPU, and then uh, jump to that section of code. Another way to uh, look at our CPU uh, profile is with a call chart. And here you can see our loop handler is, takes 5.98% of our total time, and it puts it right up at the top. And th this is another easy way to say, okay, this is probably a problem. This thing is taking more, more memory by far, or more processing time by far than any of other functions. Uh, this is also really useful. This loop handler takes a long time for each individual call. But if you have a function that takes maybe you know, 15 milliseconds for each call, so it's not a huge amount on your flame chart, but it gets called a zillion times from different places, and it's actually in uh, aggregate using a lot of CPU, then it would show up here because this is, at, this is the combined time spent on all of the calls to that function. So you might look at something and say, wow, this particular function gets used everywhere. It's taking a lot of time. Is there any way I can optimize that? So in our case, we see it's our loop handler function. We can click on it, and, uh, and it's taking quite a bit of time. So it's another way of identifying issues. So if there's a wide bar in our flame graph, it means there's a lot of CPUs being used. But deep means that there's a deep function call. And so here in our Fibonacci handler, it's calling the Fibonacci just calls itself a zillion times because it needs to get the next one, next one, next one, next one. So this is what it would look like if you had a lot of recursion and each one of the calls isn't really using much memory. So finally, capturing heap snapshots. There's a few ways to do this, but we're going to look at the way to do it in the Chrome debugger. So I have created another route that's called leak. And this is because it's hard to come up with good demos for memory leaks. So what I have is every time you hit this, every time you hit this route, it will create a new file read stream, essentially create a file read socket, and then push it onto an array and keep it in memory. And the whole point of this is just to use a lot of memory. So we hit this, it opens this, uh, the read stream for templeletter.txt. We start our program, we take a heap snapshot, take snapshot, it looks like this. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but basically this is uh, normal looking. There's nothing really jumps out here. This is organized by the constructor, the type of object that it is, and it shows you how much uh, we can see that most of the objects in our memory, or 23% of them, are strings, uh, they, and they use 29% of our memory. So now we hit that leak route of uh, 6,000 times. We go look again, and we see, oh boy, now 97% of the memory is taken up by something called JS array buffer data. And I don't even know what that is. So it's good that we can uh, start in, in investigating it here, because I don't know what JS array buffer data is. So one really useful way to use heap snapshots is to compare them over time. So you take a snapshot, you do an interaction, you take another snapshot, then you compare the two, check the deltas, and see what got created, what got deleted over that time. Um, here, when we look at the comparison view and compare snapshot two to snapshot one, we'll see uh, things to note here are that we've created 6,000 new readable states and 6,000 new read streams, and we've deleted zero. So the delta on those is plus 6,000 on each. This is obviously a place you want, might want to start looking for an issue. We can also see the allocation size and the size delta. Um, if you created 1,000 and you've deleted 1,000, the delta might be zero, but if you create thousand delete none and each one uses a lot of memory. This is a place you can look, uh, sort by this and say what is, what between these two snapshots is using more memory or are we using less memory because it got garbage collected. So we open that up uh, to look at the individual instances of it. I click on one because I don't know what it is and down at the bottom we can see the retainers and the retainers is in no, in JavaScript is automatically garbage collected. So you don't get to manually manage the garbage collection. You can't, um, you can't uh, deallocate memory. Uh, but what you do is 
there are certain things like the global scope that are considered garbage collection roots. And anything that's attached to that root, so in the global scope, say global.foo equals bar, that will never be garbage collected because it's attached to something in the global scope. If I have a function call and inside the function, I define some variables and then the function returns, then now there's nothing else pointing to those variables. Uh, we, we don't have any pointers to that location of memory, so it can be flagged for garbage collection. Because I took all of these requests and I pushed them onto an array that's attached to global, then those can never get garbage collected. We look at the retainers down here and start looking through because this stuff is somewhat confusing. There's a lot of node internals. I mouse over uh, this one thing, uh, read stream, and I, and I can see the instance of it in memory that it's referring to and inspect the properties on it. I can see there's the path says temp letter.txt, and all of a sudden I have a great clue of where I should start looking for this issue. So uh, that concludes my talk. I'm right at the end of my time here. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for coming, and thank you for GIDS uh, for hosting me. You can find slides.